to worship at Cape Covenant Church. We are glad that you're here, whether you're here in person or whether you're joining us online. If you're here, please look in the pew racks and you'll see a number of uh, different things that look like this, different cards to fill out. If you please pull out the Connect card and sign up and let us know that you're here and you can put any prayer requests in there. If you change addresses or phone numbers, please let us know that. It's really our great way to stay connected as a church body. So please do that. Also online, you'll see a, um, you'll see a link come up. We can do the exact same thing online. And if you brought an offering or a tithe today, you can give that in the blue baskets as you leave. They're at the entryway as you leave. And online, of course, uh, that is done electronically. Uh, you can do it electronically here too. You can see the links that are there on the screen. Today we're having uh, communion, and if you haven't got your elements, you can uh, see one of the ushers before the worship starts in just a few minutes and get your communion elements as you came in, either uh, and on the balcony, those are available at the doorways as you came in. And after the service is over, if you find yourself in need of prayer, if you just want somebody to pray with about something that's happening in your life, we will have somebody available down right here as soon as the service is over. So uh, just come on down and we'll have somebody pray with you. Um, in just a moment, we're going to see a video about one of the ministries here at Kent Covenant Church. It's called Celebrate Recovery. And you know, there's a lot of bad things that people fall into in this life. And sometimes it's just hard to get out by yourself. You need help to do those kinds of things. And God's grace is truly amazing. So let's take a look at Celebrate Recovery. Praise God that we have um, a loving creator God who uh, nothing is outside the realm of possibility for him. There's no place we could have gone, no, no thing we could have done that is uh, beyond his ability to repair, forgive, uh, and redeem. <clears throat> and so if, if that sounds like something that you need help with, 
Uh, Celebrate Recovery is an amazing group that meets here every week. Uh, and if you need help, just contact the church office. They'll be sure to uh, get you connected with that group. Uh, welcome, everyone. Can't come into church. My name is Peter Gothold. I'm the pastor of worship and arts here, and it is so great to be with you on this first day of May. Um, I know it's scary. That means the year is a third over. Ooh. Sorry, that was too much math for a Sunday morning. Why don't you stand? Uh, and We'll sing together uh, of a God who is both merciful and loving and inviting, but also holy and wonderful and powerful. Um, and it's this mysterious, wonderful God we serve and we worship today.
amazing thing is through the power of Jesus' blood on the cross, his death, his resurrection, and his life, we can come to this holy, perfect, righteous God. As we are and we are accepted, we are loved, we are brought in, and as we come, we are made into something new. And that new thing is full of life, full of hope, full of light for a, for a world that desperately needs it. It's a pretty amazing mystery. One that I'm intensely grateful for.
Father, the one who makes all things new through your love, by the power of your spirit, the work done on the cross and the power shown at the resurrection, Father, you make all things new. It includes, <laughs> it includes me, it includes us. Uh, God, you are working, you are redeeming, you are restoring, repairing. Father, thank you. You are so good to us. We deserve none of this. Yet in your infinite mercy and love, you've come to us, inviting us into this new life where you make us new. It's not by my power that I am made new, but by your spirit and your grace and your mercy. Father, you are so good to us. We worship you this morning with our voices, with our bodies, with our hearts, our minds, all that we are, all that you have given us. We give back to you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We worship you. We love you. We love you. We love you. And pray this in the powerful name of Jesus, the risen Lord. Amen. And amen. Please have a seat. Uh, at this time, I'd like to invite all of our Kent Cove kids to uh, turn your attention to the, the screens up here as Pastor Trina has a special message uh, for all of us. Kent Cove kids, Pastor Trina here, and our story this month is Luke 24, verses 13 through 35. The grown-ups actually learned about this story last week from Pastor Dan. So the story, it takes place three days after Jesus had died on the cross. A few of the women, they had gone to his tomb to prepare Jesus's body for burial, but his body was not there because he had risen from the dead. He was alive. But when they ran to tell the other disciples this amazing news, they didn't believe them. And this is where our story picks up because that same day, two of the disciples, they were walking to a village not far from Jerusalem called Emmaus. And they were talking about everything that had happened over the last few days. And while they were talking, Jesus himself came up and walked with them. But they were kept from recognizing him. Jesus asked them, what are you talking about? Well, they couldn't believe this question. One of them asked, how can there be anyone who doesn't know the things that have happened? Now, of course, Jesus knew exactly what they were talking about, but he asked, what things? The disciples must have been flabbergasted because they blurted out the things about Jesus of Nazareth. He was a prophet who spoke powerful words and he did miraculous things for God and for everyone. Well. He was betrayed and lied about. And the people in charge, they killed him. They crucified him. And we had hoped he was going to be the one to save Israel. But he's dead. And then something really weird happened this morning. Some women went to Jesus' tomb, but his body wasn't there. And they said they saw angels who said Jesus was alive. And Peter, he went to check it out and the tomb really was empty. We are so confused. 
Well, Jesus said to them, you are so foolish and so slow to believe all that the prophets had spoken. Didn't the Messiah have to suffer these things and then enter his glory? And then Jesus went on to remind them of all the prophets had said, beginning with Moses. So this reminded the disciples what scripture said about what would happen to the Messiah. And these were all things that happened to Jesus. Well, as they approached Emmaus, the disciples begged Jesus to stay with them. Now they still did not recognize that it was Jesus, but Jesus did stay with them. So they sat down for a meal and Jesus took the bread, he gave thanks and he broke it. And he began to give it to them. And all at once, their eyes were opened and they recognized him. And then Jesus disappeared. They looked at each other, they were so puzzled and they said, weren't our hearts burning when he was talking with us and sharing scripture with us? And they jumped up and quickly returned to Jerusalem so that they could tell the disciples what had happened. And when they did, they proclaimed, it is true, the Lord has risen. (sighs) Friends, I love this story. And one of my favorite things to do when I read a story is to ask why and to wonder, like, why didn't the disciples recognize Jesus on the road? And why didn't they believe when the women told them this amazing news about the empty tomb? I wonder how those women felt not being believed. Why did Jesus disappear like that? And I wonder why it wasn't until Jesus broke that bread that they knew who he was. So what why questions do you have and what do you wonder about? So let's ask why and wonder questions this month as we dive into this story together, all right? Okay, later friends. That Pastor Trina. At this point, I'd like to invite our kids to head to these doors back here to meet their volunteers as they go to their workshops. And as they go to church, let's sing this blessing over them. Go with God to play your part in his story. Go with bow bearers of God's glory. Go with peace to love and serve and heal. Go with love and show the world it's real. Go with love. Go
gracious and merciful God. We worship you. We thank you. We love you. We are here because of you, your greatness, your grace, your love. So, Father, we thank you. We love you. We love you. We love you. We pray this in the powerful name of Jesus. Amen. pastor here at Kent Covenant Church, and we are continuing this morning a series called The Next Normal, and our text today is from uh, the book of Acts, chapter 9, beginning in verse 1, and we're going to go through verse 22. It reads like this, meanwhile, Saul was still breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples. He went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues in Damascus, so that if he found any there who belonged to the way, whether men or women, he might take them as prisoners to Jerusalem. As he neared Damascus on his journey, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice say to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Who are you, Lord? Saul asked. I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting, he replied. Now get up and go into the city, and you will be told what you must do. The men traveling with Saul stood there speechless. They heard the sound but did not see anyone. Saul got up from the ground But when he opened his eyes, he could see nothing. So they led him by the hand into Damascus. For three days he was blind and did not eat or drink anything. In Damascus, there was a disciple named Ananias. The Lord called to him in a vision, Ananias, yes, Lord, he answered. The Lord told him, Go to the house of Judas on Straight Street and ask for a man from Tarsus named Saul, for he is praying. In a vision, he has seen a man named Ananias come and place his hands on him to restore his sight. Lord, Ananias answered, I've heard many reports about this man and all the harm he has done to your holy people in Jerusalem. And he has come here with authority from the chief priests to arrest all who call on your name. But the Lord said to Ananias, Go, this man is my chosen instrument to proclaim my name to the Gentiles and their kings and to the people of Israel. I will show him how much he must suffer for my name. Then Ananias went to the house and entered it. Placing his hands on Saul, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road as you were coming here, has sent me so that you may see again and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Immediately, something like scales fell from Saul's eyes, and he could see again. He got up and was baptized, and after taking some food, he regained his strength. Saul spent several days with the disciples in Damascus. At once, he began to preach in the synagogues that Jesus is the Son of God. All those who heard him were astonished and asked, Isn't he the man who raised havoc in Jerusalem among in Jerusalem among those who call on this name. And hasn't he come here to take them as prisoners to the chief priests? Yet Saul grew more and more powerful and baffled the Jews living in Damascus by proving that Jesus is the Messiah. Please join me in prayer. Bless us this day, O Lord, with vision. May this place be a sacred place, a telling space, where heaven and earth meet. 
Amen. So, as I mentioned, this morning we continue our series called The Next Normal. And I wanted to just give you a little background of why we're doing this. As we have been talking and, and we are all experiencing this kind of progression out of pandemic life and returning to, or going, it's not really returning to life, but, uh, or normal life. And, you know, you hear, as you talk to people, you hear a lot of people say the new normal, as if that's something different, right? And it occurred to me that really there is no such thing as the new normal. There is only the next normal, right? The more, uh, the more days and months and years I get under my belt in life, uh, I begin to recognize that there's just next normal. Because what's normal now will not be normal six months from now, maybe, will not be the, what, what I consider normal in uh, two years or three years. If there's one lesson that I hope we've learned in this pandemic experience, it's that life changes, right? So one of the things that uh, in my studies that I did was um, part of my work postgraduate work was in leadership, and we studied change dynamics. So I wanted to talk to you this morning a little bit about something called continuous and discontinuous change, okay? So continuous change looks something like this. Continuous change is somewhat predictable change. It's change that you expect. It's typical. Things go up and down in kind of the pattern that we expect. One way to think about expected change is you might say, you know, if you um, invest in the stock market, you hopefully, when you invest, know going in that that is going to go up and down. Right? It's, some, it's going to go down, it'll come back up, it'll fluctuate in between, it can be a little bit, you know, kind of wide swings, but you know that's going to happen. So that would be continuous change. Another way to think about continuous change would be to think of the, our life cycle, or as, you know, Disney had it, the circle of life, right? We're born, we begin to uh, grow, we learn to walk, we continue to mature, we become full grown, we begin to experience what that means in our bodies as they no longer, or they begin to not do the things that we are used to them doing, and then ultimately we die. That is an expected, normal, continuous change. We as human beings expect to uh, outlive our grandparents and our parents. We expect that one day we will have to do, you know, take that part of the journey that is saying goodbye to our forebears. That is continuous change. Now, dis discontinuous change is disrupted, unexpected change that requires a new and completely different approach. Now this is where, if you'll bear with me, my stock market analogy breaks down a little bit. But uh, go to the next slide, please. That, that first slide was the first uh, part of this graph. But then what you see is Black Monday in 1987, where the stock market dropped. The bottom dropped out, right? That is discontinuous change. Right now, eventually the stock market went back up and all that, so, so again, the, the metaphor breaks down a little bit. But this is, if you were mapping out your life and you were going through life as normal and something unexpected happened that completely altered your life, you know, to go back to my earlier image, that, so say perhaps the death of a child. Right? That would be discontinuous change. The loss of a job, the loss of a career, the, you know, any, any disruptive change would cause that kind of drop, right? That's discontinuous change. It requires a completely new and different approach. And if we were to graph it, it might look something like this. 
And as we get older, we recognize that discontinuous change is just as much a part of life as continuous change, right? I mean, if there's anything we know right now, it's that discontinuous change doesn't follow any kind of schedule, right? <laughs> Pandemic, insurrection, uh, verge of World War III, you know, I mean, we could go on and on and on, right? Discontinuous change. It requires a completely different approach. Now, our story this morning, we pick up in chapter 9, Saul has been persecuting the church. He's been coming after the church hard. And now he's kind of so, so hard that the church has, a lot of the believers that have left Jerusalem and they fled this persecution. And a whole bunch of them went to this city called Damascus. And so Saul has gone to the chief priests and he's gotten a letter to go to Damascus and arrest these people and bring them back so he can finish the job that he started. So that's kind of a little bit of the background of the story. Now one of the things we need to look at, and I want to be careful with this because, you know, we can get into this tendency to take these biblical characters and kind of want to psychoanalyze and figure out, well, why would Saul do this and that and the other thing? And ultimately, that might be interesting, but there's really no way for us to know. But there are a few things we can know or see in this story about Saul that I think apply to us. The first is this. Just from this behavior that we see here, Saul getting this letter from the chief priest to go to Damascus to arrest these, these heretics... What do we know about Saul? We know that Saul didn't think. Saul knew. Saul believed to the core of his being that he was right. That he knew the truth and it was his job to protect it. Because if you don't know that, you don't do what Saul is doing. So Saul has this deep down rock solid understanding of what the right belief is and he knows that Jesus is not the Messiah and these people are dangerous and they need to be stopped everything in his life everything in his training as a rabbi uh, everything in his community around him uh, I imagine probably his family as well all of that made him believe that they were certain of their beliefs, thoughts, and subsequent actions, that they were acting right, that they were doing the right thing, right? I mean, he knows. He is not messing around. And so he goes to Damascus. He heads out to Damascus to finish the work that he started. And the text tells us that as he neared Damascus, beginning in verse 3, on his journey, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice say, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Who are you, Lord? Saul asked. I am Jesus, who you, whom you are persecuting. Now get up and go into the city and you will be told what you must do. The risen Christ appears to Saul on the road to Damascus and shatters his life. Shatters his understanding of everything. Now there's a lot going on here. We could spend a lot of time in this text, but I want to look at just a couple of things that Saul had to revise in light of the appearance of the resurrected Christ on the road to Damascus. So five moves that this experience creates in Saul's life and thought. First move is that Saul uh, has to come to the recognition that everything that he thought was right was, being not only, was not only wrong, it was being rebuked by God. That's a mind-bender, folks. Right? I mean, everything you have been taught 
to believe with the earnestness of faith, with the, con with the confirmation of your religious community all around you, and everything is being rebuked because God is appearing and saying, no, you've got it backwards. He was so certain of it, and the resurrected Christ just blew it all up. Second move he has to make. He has to completely revise his understanding of, and judgment of Jesus and his teaching. He has to completely revise his understanding of Jesus and his teaching. Third thing, he has to completely revise his understanding of the Messiah. Right? Now, we don't have time to unpack that, but if you've been in church for a while, you kind of know the story, right? That the Messiah was going to come and institute his kingdom and, you know, and establish David's throne, right? It was temporal. And Jesus has come and just died on a cross and blown all that up too. But it's also clear that that kingdom was inaugurated by the death, resurrection, and ascension of Jesus. It is now present, and Saul has to figure that out. Fourth thing that this appearance does is that Saul had to recognize that God makes no distinction between his followers on earth and Jesus. Did you catch it? Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? He doesn't say, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute the church? Why do you persecute those evangelicals? Why do you persecute those Christians? Why do you, no, why do you persecute me? And so in some sense, God makes no distinction between Jesus and his church. The link between Jesus and his church is indissoluble, can't be dissolved. It's inherent. And if you persecute the church, if you persecute God's people, you persecute Jesus. And then Saul was given a, message, a mission. Go. Right? He doesn't know what that means yet, but he's told to go into the city and, and that it'll be made clear to him. So what does all this mean for us? You know, the more I read this story and thinking about the way that Saul experienced discontinuous change on the road to Damascus, right? This, this uh, appearance of the, resurrected, of the resurrected Christ requires a completely new and different understanding that he had than what he had before. He has to adapt. He has to respond to all kinds of new information and different information. And I can't help but wonder, I can't help but wonder if our certainty sometimes, if our certainty about who we are and what we believe and how that works in the world doesn't keep us from experiencing the scandal and dynamic power of the risen Christ in our lives. Now, I'm not asking you to question that Jesus is who he says he is. I think that this is very clear. But I am asking you to consider that the way we do and be and are church can have a lot of cultural accretion around it, a lot of cultural trappings that are really not necessarily of Jesus, which doesn't necessarily inherently make them evil, by the way. It's just the way we do things. For instance, you find yourselves sitting in pews. Where else in the world, in our lives, do you sit on long wooden benches? Nowhere. Well, where does that come from? Well, it comes from the middle, uh, the mid-centuries, right? The Reformation period. Because prior to that, they all stood all the time. So, you know, we stand for a few worship songs. They used to stand for the whole thing on cold marble floors. And then somebody came up with the idea, well, if we made these long benches, we could sit. Right? It's a cultural accretion. It's just, a, it's just something we do. Now, 
I once had a church, it's a long story for another day, remove the pews. You want to talk about sacred cows making gourmet burgers. <laughs> but I use this as an example. There are a lot of different ways that the way that we are church has nothing to do with the resurrected Christ. And in fact, because we're so dogmatically committed to it, we crowd out his appearance. Because we know what we know what we know, and we know it's right. We were trained to know it's right. Just like Saul was trained and taught from the Scriptures that the Messiah was to come and to establish the throne of David and to throw those dirty, foul Romans out. So Jesus couldn't possibly be the Messiah because he died on a cross. So the application for us, friends, is to maybe ask the question, I wonder if our certainty about who Jesus is and where he calls us keeps us from experiencing the resurrected Christ. Saul had to have his life entirely blown up for him to see it. The resurrected Christ appeared on the road to Damascus, and, and Saul's life, as we know, was never the same, and neither was his name. We, in our Christian bubble value, we prize, in many ways, certainty and rigidness in thought reflexively. Right? Right? Just imagine if somebody came to you and um, challenged one of your confirmed beliefs that you have been taught ever since you were a, a young pup, what that might do to you. Now again, I'm not saying we should just oh willy-nilly decide to change everything, but I am saying that we should be willing to allow the Spirit to prompt us to examine what it is that we think we understand. It's called humility and it's a virtue. We get rigid and sure of our rightness. We don't like to be challenged. We don't like our comfort threatened. And honestly, sometimes the longer we are like that, we get a little hard to live with. But the other thing I noticed about this text as I'm reading through this story is that it offers another way of being. It offers another way of being, another view of following. The text tells us in verse 10 that in Damascus there was a disciple named Ananias. And the Lord calls to him in a vision, Ananias, yes, Lord, he answered. The Lord said, go to the house of Judas on Straight Street, which actually, I'm told, is still actually a street in Damascus. And ask for a man from Tarsus named Saul, for he is praying in a vision. He has seen a man named Ananias, convenient, come and place his hands on him to restore his sight. Lord, this, no, <laughs> no, 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 no. This guy, this guy's bad news. You can't send me to this guy. Let me remind you what he's doing. Right? And so Ananias has this little conversation, which coincidentally, uh, I love this in Scripture. You'll find this in a, a number of different places, especially the Old Testament, but here where you know, God appears to someone that he's calling to do a mission, and their response is like, ah, wait a minute, let's have a, let's have a conversation. Right? And sometimes I think it's, that's a good model of prayer for us. We need to learn to ask, to voice, to say, you know what, I don't think that's right. I'm pretty sure you're forgetting who this Saul guy is because he's killing people. But the Lord said to Ananias, go. And then skipping a little bit, the text tells us, then Ananias 
went. Isn't that interesting? Ananias had verifiable information as to why he should not listen to this command. But the Spirit said, go, and after some conversation, he went. Then Ananias went. Friends, I think I've said this here before. You'll pardon me if I, if I did, but I really believe this. You know, the longer I have been a pastor and the longer I have walked with people through life and see it in my own life, the longer I am convinced that the key to being a follower of Jesus is simple obedience to the Holy Spirit. Simple obedience to the Holy Spirit. Now believe me, I believe in theology. I believe in doctrine. I got all the letters behind my name to prove it. I've gone all the way with that stuff. And I value it. And it's super important. And it needs to, and it needs to be done. And we need to know this stuff. But if that becomes the primary form of our discipleship, we will lose touch with the Holy Spirit. And we will become rigid know-it-alls who are impossible to live with. And we will find ourselves eventually, maybe on our own road to Damascus, sure that we are doing the right thing, supporting the right person, following the right politics, doing the right thing, and we will find ourselves where we did not intend to go and find ourselves somewhere that is not of God. But instead, if we develop a simple obedience like Ananias, that's willing to hear from the Spirit and engage in conversation, and then when the Spirit says go, the text says of us, and then so and so went. What if, instead of relying on our certainty, and our theology, and our doctrine, we relied on the leading of the Holy Spirit, and we went and did what we were called to do and were who we are called to be. What might happen? Well, I think this text gives us a glimpse of what can happen when we follow the simple guidance of the Holy Spirit. Because Ananias going, you can make the argument, Ananias going was a fulcrum on which history rested. The greatest missionary in our tradition, Paul, if Ananias says, you know, God, this guy's killing people. I'm not going. Now, God probably would have found somebody else. But, you know, who knows? But my argument is, imagine what happens. So what happens when we simply obey? When the Spirit says go and we go? We can't know. We, we can't know, but it can be pretty amazing. World-changing, in fact. Let us pray. Gracious God, we thank you for your love for us. We thank you that you pursue us even in the midst of our certainty, even in the midst of knowing that we are right. You disrupt our lives. You turn them upside down. And you bring sight to our blind eyes. God, may it be so in us. Amen. So friends, this morning we come to the table. And uh, just a couple words about that. As, uh, if you are visiting with us or you're new to Kent Covenant Church, we here at Kent Covenant and in the Covenant Church practice what is called an open table, which means that we believe this is the Lord's table. 
And so if you trust in Jesus, if you want to follow Jesus, this meal is for you. Also, we've learned over the course of our pandemic journey together, we have our handy sanitary little communion elements. If you take the the tab of that and break it down until you feel it click or you hear it click, then it will be much easier to open when we get to that part. And I encourage you at this time just to go ahead and do that, get those started so that when we get to the point when we're actually taking the elements together, that that will be ready. Also, if, if you did not receive the elements when you came in, just raise your hand. One of our ushers will get those to you. And, um, and we just encourage you to hold on to those. We will partake of the elements together as one body. Friends, it is now our sacred privilege to celebrate the sacrament of the Lord's Supper. All who humbly put their trust in Christ and desire his help that they may lead a holy life, all who are truly sorry for their sins and would be delivered from them, all who would walk in love with their neighbors and intend, and intend to live a new life, following the commandments of God and walking from now on in his holy ways, are invited to draw near in faith and to receive these holy sacraments. Friends, this is the joyful feast of the people of God. Many will come from east and west and from north and south and sit at table in the kingdom of God. This is the Lord's table. table. Our Savior invites those who trust him to share the feast that he has prepared. According to Luke, when our risen Lord was at table with his disciples, he took bread and blessed and broke it and gave it to them, and their eyes were opened, and they recognized him. Please join me in prayer. We do not presume to come to this your table, O merciful God, trusting in our own righteousness, but in your manifold and great mercies. We are not worthy so much as to gather up the crumbs under your table, but you are the same Lord whose nature is always to have mercy. Grant us, therefore, gracious Lord, so to eat the bread and drink the cup that we may evermore dwell in him and he in us. Amen. Hear the words of our Lord Jesus Christ as they are delivered by the Apostle Paul. For I received from the Lord what I also handed on to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took a loaf of bread And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, broken for you. Do this in remembering me. In the same way, he took the cup also after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and you drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Please join me in prayer. Lord of all, we offer our sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving to you, presenting to you from your creation this bread and this cup. Gracious God, we pray that you will send your Holy Spirit on these gifts that they may be the sacrament of the body of Christ and the blood of the new covenant. Unite us to your Son in his death and resurrection, that we may be acceptable through him, being sanctified by the Holy Spirit. In the fullness of time, put all things in subjection under your Christ, and bring us to that heavenly feast where with all your saints we will be gathered in glory everlasting through Jesus Christ our Lord, the firstborn of all creation, the head of the church, and the author of our salvation. By him and with him and in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. Brothers and sisters, 
This is the body of Christ broken for you. Eat with thanksgiving. Friends, this is the cup of the new covenant in the blood of Christ. Drink with great joy. <clears throat> bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, and forget not all his benefits. Please join me in prayer. Loving God, you graciously feed us who have received these holy mysteries with the bread of life and the cup of eternal salvation. May we who have, been, who have received this sacrament be strengthened in your service. We who have sung your praises tell of your glory and truth. We who have seen the greatness of your love see you face to face in your kingdom. For you have made us your own people by the death and resurrection of your Son, our Lord, and by the life-giving power of your Spirit. Amen.
Brothers and sisters, receive the benediction. What we have been about here is not separate from life. Rather, these acts have been a reminder that we belong to Christ always and everywhere. We carry Christ's Spirit into our homes, our daily activities, all our relationships. We are Christ's people. By God's grace, let it be so. Amen.